we got this, go get them. Absolutely. No, thank you. I wish they had elevator music. Seth said it this morning, but it would make it a lot more entertaining for do, 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 do. <laughs> Right? Or Jeopardy. That would be great. I Anything. think that's still going uh, in the other session. I'm right. sure. Um, okay. People are starting to trickle in. So we don't have Kyla with us. Uh, no, but we'll start and then hopefully she'll... If she joins, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so we will let people trickle in, but I don't want to take up any time, so I will get started. Um, welcome everybody to uh, today's this session. Sorry, I have my dog here. So if you hear a bark, virtual problems. <laughs> um, so today we are having this quick session on um, testing positive. So we are fortunate enough to have genetic counselor Ramona Moldovan, sorry if I butchered that, <laughs> um, and our panelists, uh, Gabby from the US, Parker from Canada, and uh, Kayla will be joining us from Australia. And they've all uh, bravely joined us to share their experience of testing positive. Um, so we thank you very, very much for your courage and your bravery um, to share your stories with us. Um, if anybody in the session has a question for anybody on the panel um, or general questions about testing positive, please use the question and answer function. Um, and then I will uh, filter through those at the end and we will get some answers for you. So without further ado, you guys can take it away. Thank you very much. I'm, hi everyone, I'm absolutely delighted to be here today and such a pleasure to see uh, quite a few of you were able to join us. Uh, my name is Ramona Moldovan. I'm a genetic counsellor and I'm currently based uh, in Manchester, but my work with the EHD community has been uh, mainly in Transylvania, Romania for the last uh, 10 years or so, but that's a completely different story. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to, to be here today with uh, Parker, joining us from Canada and Gabby from the United States. And hopefully, I know it's very early in Australia, Kayla will join us uh, uh, in a bit. But we, before we hear from uh, Gabriel and uh, um, Gabby, I think, I, 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 hopefully I'm allowed to say that, uh, and Parker, let me just give you a very, very quick overview of the genetic testing uh, process. And I'm sure you don't need me to convince anyone here about the importance of good genetic counseling and follow up in relation to genetic testing. But essentially the aim of genetic uh, counseling is to make sure that any individual proceeding with a test feels it has been the right decision for him or her. Predictive testing in particular is a complex and personal decision and ultimately we don't want anyone experiencing feelings of regret. So ideally, we want individuals to make fully informed decisions about testing, whilst taking into account their personal context and family situations and so on. So we very much try to help everyone prepare for the results and adapt to the results. I know that protocols for delivering HD predictive tests will vary between countries and indeed centers, but it usually involves three or four appointments, including the appointment where the blood sample is taken and uh, the results session as well. Obviously, there are a number of things that can happen, uh, uh, good and bad, but particularly a few things where good genetic counseling and support can be uh, jeopardized. 
for example, lack of understanding of the nature of a predictive test amongst other clinicians, uh, that might be an issue. Access to genetic uh, centers for predictive testing. Private testing companies offering very little or no uh, counseling pre or post uh, uh, testing or costs even when testing is not reimbursed relationships with the clinician. So there are quite a few other things you may have experienced yourself in addition to what I just mentioned. Obviously, there's so much we can discuss here today, the science, the guidelines, the practicalities, and the overall uh, experience of the process. So I know quite a bit was already covered in the sessions yesterday and today, so I will not do that. You'll be pleased to know. Uh, what we're trying to, to do today is to collect, to draw on the collective knowledge and experience uh, and encourage a conversation where your voice can be heard. So this is where your experience, Gabby and Parker in particular, is so invaluable. So thank you both very much for agreeing to share some of that today. So I think Gabby is going to go first, uh, if you're happy with that, Gabby. And just... I guess, for, yeah, what can you tell us about your story and what was the whole process like for you? Sure. So first of all, Ramona, thank you so much um, for being here and for, you know, having faith in us and standing by our side while we kind of share our stories. Um, this is a very vulnerable place for anyone to be. So A, I wanted to say, um, bear with me and also, um, not that you guys wouldn't or ever have not, but also um, for other people, just I want to say you guys are rock stars, um, A, for being here and B, for being brave enough to, to share your story. So um, I'm blown away by this community every single day. Like I just get more and more proud of us for rising above. Um, but my story is, so my mom was one of four and um, all at risk for Huntington's, but their father was, um, they, they kind of thought he was an alcoholic um, drunk and he had left, he was angry and he had left and kind of estranged himself from the family. And then 20, uh, almost 20 years later after he leaves the family, after um, all of my mom have like all of our, all of our cousins, my cousins and myself and my brother find out that this is, they're all at risk for it. So three of the four tested positive um, asymptomatically and my mom being one of them and we were already born at this point. So uh, fast forward, my whole life was really just, kind, my whole life was for the most part removed from Huntington's because my mom's family was on the other side of the country in Washington state. So we would go there once a year or so um, and kind of be immersed into those Huntington's type families. But my mom wasn't very sick up until the point that I was about 10 or 11 is when she started showing motor, some, um, motor fun function issues. So we were very, very blind to it until we you know, would expose ourselves in Washington for holidays and such. And I remember saying to my mom, um, you know, is this going to happen to you? Because um, we knew that she was sick. They had sat us down and said that, you know, our mom wouldn't be like other moms. And if she has a broken brain, you can't expect someone with a broken leg to run. So why would we expect your mom with a broken brain to be able to function like a normal person? So that was confusing. And I don't think Huntington's disease was a word or a thought in my mind until I was 10, again, 10, 11, 13, um, learning how to Google and figuring out what Huntington's disease was and what it meant for myself. So at the time that I figured all of this out, unfortunately, I was about 13 and I was in the midst of being a teenager and an angsty teen, like coming into my own. And this just did not help. Uh, my mom was going so downhill and um, all of my friends were getting ready to, you know, go away to college and make their next life change. And I wanted to play softball in college for a college a couple hours away from my home. Um, but I, I didn't end up doing that because I just couldn't picture myself being away from my mom. Um, at the point that it was time to go to college, she was totally dependent on 
my others for care. And um, so it was really a lot of me going to school and then coming home and bathing her and feeding her and feeding her pills and walking her um, and not knowing what type of mom I was going to come home to. So it was all very walking on eggshells for the entire span that she was sick. And um, up until I was about 18, my brother had kind of mentioned to me that he was thinking about getting tested, which was news to me because I always, to him, him and I kind of never really discussed that, uh, but my brother was older. And so I kind of thought, I know that I wanted to know one day, it wasn't something that was like burning inside of me, but I knew that when the time was right, I'd want to. So I decided that I, at 18, I would go ahead and do it with my brother who um, really, really had, an, had a yearning to know. And I just said, let's just rip it off like a Band-Aid. And that was the same year that my, uh, my mom had gone, gone into a uh, nursing home. So um, it, was, it was about a year of the, of the testing process. And um, all of these things are, I would say nightmares that I had leading up to it were all based on this day and, get, and finding our results. And it was always the nightmare of what if I have it and my brother doesn't? What if my brother has it and I don't? Um, what if we both don't have it? And I never dreamt that we would, would both have it. And I remember on the day of that we decided we were gonna go in together. And my genetic counselor was a family friend who knew my mom. And she had kind of broken the rules for us a little bit to be able for my brother and I to um, find out our results in the same room together, which typically you're not supposed to because um, it's a lot of conf confliction. Like it's, for most families, it's a very, very tough coin toss, but we decided that that was gonna be best for us. And so as we were sitting in the waiting room, trying to not talk about the fact that our lives were just about to be turned upside down, my brother had said to me that he wanted to, he wanted to know first because he felt like he had it and that I didn't, and he wanted to leave on good note. And so I said, okay, I said, that's fair. And right before, we could even say another word. Our counselor came out and said, um, are you guys ready? And we walked back and the second we sat down, I could just tell she didn't, you know, she looked right down at her paper and um, didn't ask, like we didn't even have a second to say that we wanted to hear it this way or that way. And it was just like, okay, um, you know, Gabby, you will have a CAG, re you have a CAG repeat of 50 and your brother has a CAG of, 48. So she walked out and um, that felt again, like a dream. It felt like, okay, I, my first reaction was, this is a dream. Said it out loud, said, I'm going to wake up from this. Um, and I just, we just never imagined or prepared for both. And it was the most humbling earth shattering day of my life. Um, but the coolest part about all of this is that it's been six years. So it's been six years since I've been diagnosed and I've done so much throughout this, these six years. And I think that that's the part of the story that I really want to focus on is having a life after testing positive. Um, and I've also lost my mom since she passed away in 2017. So, um, I've lost my mom. I've run, I ran the Chicago marathon, um, never was a runner, but. I did that in 2019. Um, I moved out of state, so I never would have imagined that I would ever leave home. And I moved out of state like six hours away from my hometown with my boyfriend and our two cats. And um, I started a business this year. So I have, um, I'm sorry, last year. So I have a crazy, um, crazy opportunities that have fallen into my lap that I've been able to say yes to that being my mom's caregiver never would have allowed me to do. And so more than my diagnosis, um, right now it's figuring out who I am outside of 
being my mom's caregiver. Um, that's something that I still struggle with every day. And, um, you know, it gets better with time, but it's just one of those things that's ingrained in your brain. And so saying yes to all of these opportunities has really helped me figure all that out. Um, but all of this to say, every single year, I just look back at the date of getting my diagnosis and I say to myself, I didn't even think we would be able to last six months. And every single year is another milestone for me to say, wow, this isn't a day I dread anymore. Um, this is a day that is about who I've become because of it. And has there been hardship? Oh my gosh, every second of every day is hard. And that, that doesn't go away. But you learn to live with this diagnosis, this grief that is going to be in you forever. And that's not such a bad thing to have that living in with you and being at peace with that. It's all about being at peace with yourself. So whether or not that's with hunting tents, yeah, yeah. you need to find peace. Um, but that's, that's about it for my story and I can't wait to hear from the rest. Yeah, well, thank you, Gabby. That was such a powerful story and I have so many questions to ask, but I'm thinking, and I, I can see the audience has a few questions as well. I'm just wondering about Parker, if you would like to uh, go next and see if any uh, of the, or from Gabby's story resonated with you, did that sound familiar or unfamiliar? What was it like for you? Um, there's a lot of similarities, a lot of differences. Um, I come from a split family, so I was in my mom's primary caregiver, something I, I live with my dad. So I, I would see her uh, a couple times a month on weekends. I'd stay overnight. So there was times where I would be a caregiver, but it wasn't an all time thing for me. Um, Huntington's has been in my life for as long as I can remember. Uh, my, the only memories I have of my grandmother is my mom and my uncle going to see her in a hospital bed. So Huntington's has been prevalent since as long as I can remember. There's never been a part of my life that didn't have Huntington's in it. Um, and then like my mom started showing symptoms in her early twenties. Um, and I think uh, like we all, cause I come from six siblings, five of who are at risk from the same mom. Um, two had already been tested negative by the time I decided to test. So it was all in all of our plans to get tested early. It had always been a part of our lives. Um, I think I decided to get tested in 2016. So I think I was uh, 21 at the time. Um, my mom was in a full-time home. Uh, her husband passed away, like my stepdad. Um, and, and I thought I was ready at the time I don't know why I kind of put it off after I was 18 I thought it was going to be like right away go get tested figure it out like that was always like my number one priority and I guess uh, as you get older and, and th you got a lot going on in your early 20s it just it didn't become a priority for me um but I, I, I was in a serious relationship at the time I, ha I had my first used truck to me I had my first apartment there was a lot of good things going my way um so when, when I did decide to get tested, it was all like a positive experience for me. Like I, I didn't ever think I could test uh, positive. Everything was negative. After I had two people in my family, I already go negative. And I'm, I'm such a positive person. Like I, I, didn't, I didn't plan it the way I wish I did. Um, like when they called which me for my that, results. Parker, if I can interrupt you, which, which uh, way is that? So I didn't have any support systems ready or available. So when I got my blood work ready, I went on my lunch break while I was working. So everybody else that I had available was working. So I couldn't call anybody. I had no one. And I had to go back to work and deal with people that weren't ready to support me. Um, so like I had no support system. So I just remember uh, driving to the hospital, playing music. I probably stopped for a coffee. Like I only was prepared just to test negative. There's no thought in my mind that I was going to test positive at all. Um, so I, I didn't take the, necess the necessary steps that I should have to have the proper uh, like support systems in place. So when I went, I just remember the doctor, I, cause I, I thought I was too cool for everybody. I thought I was the tough guy. You know, you, you don't show emotion when you're at that age. So I, I went at my lunch break and, um, they gave me the results. And I just remember like the, the waterfall of emotions I was going through, but I had to hold it together for the doctor. So I just took the paperwork, didn't really look at it. And I just kind of left. And, and it didn't really hit me until I got back to work and I actually had to say it to somebody. 
right? Like it, it was, I was, I was, I kept it together driving to work. And then my coworker asked me and like, he was only prepared for the positive because that's what I was prepared for. So he's like, oh, so, so how did it go with a smile on his face? And I, I broke down at work. And I just remember all, all these emotions going over me. And I just, it wasn't the place I needed to be. I, I didn't need to be at work. I didn't need those people there as much as they did help. It wasn't the right people in place. Um, and then I had to go home and I remember coming home at lunch and I had no one to call. There was no one around. Um, my girlfriend was working. Everybody works days. Um, and then what I did was I panicked. So then I started calling people and leaving messages that I had tested positive. So like, which is not the right thing to do because that's not the way you want to tell people. Right. So like, it, it, this is a day that when you get tested, you'll never forget. So you should make it something that's a, a positive memory. Take all the necessary steps and, and all the like different things you can do to make yourself comfortable. Cause I didn't do any of that. Now that I look back on it, it's not, it's not the best memory in the world. It, it was really tough. Um, it got better at the end of the day when like my sisters finished work and they got the messages and we all met up and it, like it ended up being awesome and, and it's good now, but like for that, initial time like I'll never forget those emotions that I had to go through myself thank you Parker again I was just going to jump in one more thing and that I forgot to harp on please do Parker, thank you for sharing your story and you reminded me to say have a plan have a plan for the day the week the month it's yeah. so important and, and don't rush like now I do way more so I've taken the testing positive and used it as a I get up every morning at five in the morning and I work out I meditate I run 10 kilometers a day I'm going to do like, I, I got motivation that my friends will never have at this age. Like I'm changing my life that, so for me, it's, it's, it's still such a positive thing, but I'm in such a different place than what I was when I was 21 and got tested. Right. So like, it's, it's been a positive thing for me through and through. It's helped me grow as a person. Like, I'm still glad I got tested. Right. Like I'm, I'm so after my life right now, I couldn't be any more happy with where I'm at and where I'm going. And like you said, like, in, since I've been tested in the last six years, I've accomplished so much. And I still plan to accomplish more things, right? Like I just started an electrical apprenticeship. Like I'm not counting my days, right? Like I'm, I'm making every day count. This is really brilliant, Parker. Thank you. And I'm all, I almost feel like I'm not needed in the panel really because you're <laughs> doing such a great job uh, uh, sharing your experience and complementing each other. And what you said at the la uh, 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 in the last couple of minutes, Parker, it almost sounded like a piece of advice or just a heads up for people uh, who might consider this uh, and I was wondering about you Gabby did, do you feel like there's an advice or a piece of advice or some thoughts you think other people might use uh, going forwards I guess if they're if they're thinking of choosing this this path yes <clears throat> um, and again it's going to kind of go off exactly what Parker just said but I'm going to really hammer home the fact that you you really need a support system in place. You need, it doesn't need to be a girlfriend, it doesn't need to be a partner, it doesn't need to be um, a family member, but you need people that you know love you unconditionally and that you love unconditionally. Um, this is something that, again, Parker, myself, like it's, you think that you're strong enough to handle those words and you're not and they hurt and they sting no matter what no matter how much you prepare but you need that plan in place to say if I'm having a bad day on day four do I have to go to work do I have to go to school so that that was my hardest part was I did give myself the time and then on top of that we had a huge snowstorm so we were snowed in anyways for a couple days but even still like going back to school that next week I was in class and I remember just walking to class and thinking to myself everyone around me is laughing having a good day what don't they know about my world being crumbled right now and that was again part of the piece of the grief where you're like okay I'm just another person in the world like I have to keep going and so that normalization does help that process but it's not it's not easy, um, but you're so much stronger than you realize. That's really interesting what you just said there, Gabby, thinking about the things that may not appear to be helpful, but they were helpful uh, looking back. So I'm just wondering what was the most 
and the least, I guess, but what was the most helpful thing you were personally told or the most helpful thing that happened at the time, Park and then you, Gabby, uh, 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 throughout the process, do you think? Don't rush. You know what I mean? Like you may think you're ready right when you're 18, but you, you grow so much as a person between the ages of 18 and like 28 right where you are when you're 18 if it's not a good spot the odds that like not everything lasts so if if, if it's good times enjoy the good times if it's bad times just know it's not always going to be forever right so don't rush the journey everybody's different just because other people in the hd community feel like they have to get tested right at 18 doesn't mean you should and, and get involved with the community it's something that i wasn't involved in and like uh like we were saying like your support system really shouldn't be your brother or your sister because they're if that you test positive they're going to feel distraught about it so it should be like a, a really good friend or someone in the hd community right. and what was yeah. the most helpful thing for you gabby the most helpful thing you were told or the most helpful thing that happened to you yeah i would say number one would be just hmm i would have to say again the support system, um, having the people, the key people who knew what I was going through step by step, um, not as if it was a secret, but almost like an untold understanding um, of, of love and like unconditional support that you don't get from every friend you have. So it's important to find those and hold on to them tightly and not push them away. And that's another big thing is that people want to be there for you. They want to be. And you, you, we always do this thing where we maybe think we're not worthy of love or understanding or patience. And it's crazy because all these people have done is show that they want to be part of our lives, but yet we still have this notion to push them away and try to protect them from what's coming. Um, so I would say, again, just lean on your people and don't let the ones who don't know how to be there for you ruin it for the ones who do. Thank you. I think Jacqueline is here with us because there are a few questions from the audience, Jacqueline, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, Parker, Gabby, thank you. Um, being vulnerable and sharing this story is so challenging, but to both your points, like sharing your experience is only going to help others. Um, I am a proud member of this club with you. Um, I tested positive about seven years ago and I, um, I have learned so much and I have gained so much. And to Parker's point, you know, I was involved in the community a little bit beforehand and, and was getting involved with my local chapters and my youth around me. Um, but, um, so for support and stuff, what I, my advice is, is have different people for different things. Um, so I have um, one of my best friends, maybe you saw him in the track host, uh, Seth. Um, him and I have connected a number of years ago, and he's my person that I can go to and I can say, you know what, what if this sucks? What if this happens? And he can be right there with me to just like, you know, share that concern and share that fear and not have somebody be like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, because, you know, it is something you can worry about um, and you're allowed to, but then have those people that are going to lift you up and, you know, brighten your day and let you cry and have those things. Um, for bringing somebody to your testing, I, my big thing is bring somebody who you don't have to turn around and comfort yeah. mm -hmm. because it's your day and you shouldn't have to turn around and make sure somebody else is okay. Mm -hmm. You know, save those people for later. Save those people for <laughs> later. Yeah, <laughs> um, so yes, thank you. I appreciate you guys so much. Oh, um, okay, so we have some questions here. Um, one for Ramona, and I think this is really important. A lot of people get genetic counseling, you know, up to their appointment, um, whether that's one session or several sessions, that looks different. Um, but then after your positive result, that relationship kind of terminates or so it feels. Um, is that normal or what should somebody do after they get their positive results? Well, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking that. So I think follow up is usually something we do offer. So at least one session follow up should be offered to everyone going through a test, regardless of testing positive or negative. And follow up, uh, I guess, is very much tailored to the individual. 
uh, particularly everyone participating in, result, uh, in research or in Role HD or uh, a number of other projects. But I would say follow up is uh, probably organized annually, but at least one session after the results should be uh, offered. And if for some reason it's not offered, it's very much up to you to ask for it because it can be arranged for you. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, and yeah, very important. Again, support, support, support. Yeah. Um, uh, if I guess my, this other question is, did you, any of you get tested anonymously? And then Ramona, what would be your suggestions on that? Or pros and cons? I did not. I did not test anonymously. I didn't even know that was a thing actually until after, but I would have chosen the system route. Yeah, I, I didn't know it was a thing either. I did, I did not test them out anonymously. Well, I think testing, I'm not even sure on the option for that. If that country specific, so that okay. might fall in your realm. Um, hmm. I do know people in the States who have tested negative, um, or sorry, tested anonymously. So for the person who did that, I will get you some answers and more information if you want. Um, so yeah, I've seen it too in the U.S. I've, I know a couple of people, but I can't remember exactly how that works. But yeah, we'll definitely look into that. I think definitely with the NHS or with the main healthcare national system, testing anonymously is not really an option. Uh, so absolutely, uh, yeah, it's something that has to be addressed. But I do know that uh, testing and uh, genetic testing protocols, counseling, and so on can be quite different if done privately. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm not just discussing international guidelines here for genetic counseling and or testing. I do have to acknowledge the fact that things or the process can be quite different uh, in various uh, private companies. So we really have to factor that in some of it for the best, but not always, uh, I'm afraid to say. Well, we will get some answers on that. So thank you for that. Um, and Courtney, uh, testing anonymously, anonymously means not having to disclose who you are. So I'm Jacqueline, but I could go in as Parker if I wanted to. <laughs> um, so this, I think, is a great question because I think it's important and something that I struggle with um, and, and have problems getting stuck in is, do you sometimes get scared for the future? And then if you do, what do you do to deal with it? I'll go first, Parker. Um, yes, uh, I, that's the whole part about this is that you, what I wanted, to, what I had harped on was that I've accomplished so much. And I think like everybody who's been tested can attest to this, like you accomplish so much and you're so proud of yourself and it gives you that spark and that joy to keep going. But it is a constant battle of also being able to separate your thoughts of the future. And that's a lot of anxiety that nobody knows how to deal with and we shouldn't have to deal with. So give yourself some grace there. Um, but those feelings, the negative, the fear, the anxiety, the stress, all day, all day, every day. And it goes in waves, I would say. And so what I do when I'm really feeling that way is I actually just think of something super peaceful. I think of like how excited I'll be when I have kids and when I'm healthy and I get married and we, you know, take that step. Like I actually will close my eyes and think that way, like picture that, um, that journey. And it kind of helps ease that negativity towards it all because first it's going to be a beautiful light and it's going to be like, we're going to change this world. And bring really strong and healthy kids into it. Hopefully that's my plan. Um, so that this ends here for my family, but the battle in your head of feeling afraid for the future, it's something that you, that will be with you forever. Um, I guess for me, I'm, I'm not really any more afraid of the future than somebody else my age, right? Like as a 27 year old trying to buy a house, trying to find a career, like, everybody struggles and I don't let Huntington's factor out about that. Like I, I could, I could, I could get hurt in a car accident or something. So like I, I, I take a, a
time out. Like I, I'm up two hours before work in the morning and I meditate. I'm very mindful. So like I'm a very in the moment person. So like the future doesn't worry about me. I'm just worried about like taking control today and doing all the things I can today and then waking up tomorrow and trying to be a, a better person than I was today. And it's been, it does really good for me. It doesn't work for everybody, but like, I, I yeah, not more than anybody else my age. Like I'm, I'm, I'm obviously stressed out because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to buy a house and the housing market's going crazy. Like I'm not any more stressed out than somebody that would test negative or positive. Like I'm, I'm pretty mentally solid, I guess. I love it. Amen. <laughs> Awesome. And Ramona, do you have any, like, what would you suggest people focus on if they are starting to worry about the future? Do you have any suggestions for outlets or coping strategies that might help them? There, there are so many things we could, uh, we could do, I guess, but it's always good to sometimes go back to the very basic, something that's handy for everyone. For example, thinking on what helped you in the past, what, where did you get the strength or the resilience or the enthusiasm or the power to uh, to go on when uh, in the past when you dealt with when you dealt with something difficult or unpleasant and always go back to that toolbox of resources you already have but sometimes with testing uh, uh, for HD or with many other difficulties in our lives we tend to forget that we do have a toolbox. Uh, of resources and strengths because it's just it's it's uh it can be quite distracting isn't it and it can be devastating for many people so just going back to the strengths and the resilience you already have and probably that's uh, uh one of the first things we can do but also get in touch with your support network and that might be friends that might be charities that might be your uh, genetic counselor or the geneticist you see or the medical team look to, looking after you or your family so there's always always support or just go, yeah go on hdyo and there's uh, and then the world uh, is your oyster and there's so much even yeah more support than you anticipate ask for help really yeah and last point i'll make on that subject going off of Ramona, like part of my toolbox also is being able to say hey i went through this i lost my mom I was my mom's caregiver. I grew up with this mindset, like I got diagnosed and I did this, I lost my mom. Like all of these things kind of put into perspective, things that you never thought you could do and be stronger because of, you've done. So that's the perspective also that I kind of give myself. Brilliant. Brilliant, thank you guys. Okay, we're gonna have one last question and then I'll let the people go to the next session. But this one I just think is super important um, is how does the panel, so Parker and Gabby, how do you guys keep HD from interfering with relationships and dating? Parker, go ahead. Um, it's kind of hard for me. I, 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 the relationship I'm currently in now kind of like happened over the last six months. So it kind of came up after the fact. Um, and then before that, I was in a long-term relationship. I wouldn't say like, let it affect you, but don't, if it's going to get serious, you, you definitely have to bring it up. Um, I think it's a lot easier now with Facebook and Instagram because it's all over my posts, Cure HD. So it, it, it comes up in conversation a lot easier now, right? If, if you're just open with it you don't try to hide it the odds that it comes up in a conversation and um yeah just don't let people judge you for it right if they don't want to be with you that's their fault you know what i mean you're gonna you're an awesome person right like um but I, like my girlfriend's cool with it now like we talk about it now she, she's involved so like it, it it hasn't affected me at all like i'm i'm in a new relationship and it's going great congrats that's awesome thank you um yeah and i think it is so important to hold on to love my goodness um so I would say that my, my um, love life was a, was a big fear for me not wanting to get tested because I always had this internal feeling of, again, being a burden, seeing how my mom was feeling like a burden her whole life. And I, that was something that was unfortunately just ingrained that we're, you know, reworking through. But the hardest part for me was I was single when I started the process and then met my now 
boyfriend of seven years, David, right before the month before I was getting my results. Like we had already had them scheduled. And so I was kind of secretive with him for the first like few weeks. Um, but then it was a very apparent um, thing that like it was really bothering me because it was coming up. So I thought to myself, let me just tell him and give him an out. So I told him, hey, in 26 days, I'm going to know this. And also, here's a video of my mom. This is what she looks like now. And um, it's okay if you want to run. And he like was just like, um, okay. He's like, well, not much scares me, he said. Um, and for you to feel like you have to go through this journey alone is not fair either. Um, and he said, so I would like to be a part of your journey if you want me there. And again, like I'd only known him for a month or so, but I'm thinking, wow, this is really nice. Um, and he just came through for me. Like actions just spoke so much louder than words during that time. And he went above and beyond for me to make me feel comfortable. And um, I was worried about whether or not like this was gonna be real. And is he, a, is this just puppy love? Is it just, you know, whatever. And um, he just really, 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 I didn't bring him into the room with us because I thought to myself that this was something I had always planned on doing on my own. Um, so seven years and now we're still together. I would still say I'm happy that he didn't come in because that day was again for myself and something that I planned for with my family and had a way of how we wanted to do it. Um, so he obviously took no offense, but um, it was having him our relationship grew so fast and it was, it matured so quickly. And um, after I tested positive, none of the things that I was worried about happened. He's been better every day, um, given me no reason to think that, you know, he's going anywhere. And um, so I'm really lucky on that front, but I was definitely very concerned about who am I going, how and who is going to be my partner that's going to be here for the ride? And um, that was a big reason why I didn't want to get tested actually at first, because I wanted to kind of establish that relationship. But um, it was more of a concern than I thought it would be. And I'm happy that I let him in because it, it, he proved himself over seven years that he was serious. I think a big point on that is just like, letting people love you letting right? them like, love you yep ab absolutely right like don't make the decisions for them if they want to be in your life if they want to be part of this journey that's their decision to make so yeah just like just let them love you exactly gosh i love you both so much Stop, i love you too <laughs> deep breath we're almost done you know it too um i think that's so important and like the two points that you know i constantly remind myself is if one it, like Parker said, if, if somebody doesn't want to be with you because of that, that's that, that's on them, right? Like that's that's not you. So that's on them. That and you shouldn't want to be with somebody who doesn't want to take care of somebody, right? Like exactly. And then, like Gabby, what you said is, like, um, oh my gosh, I looked at my dog and I got distracted. I'm You're sorry. fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, I think it's um, like somebody told me once at camp that. HD has given them more than it's ever taken away. And I think between what you guys have all said is that that's so true, um, is that you get to build from this experience. And even if it's like a hurry up and wait game, you're filling it with crushing your dreams and chasing or and like building new goals and having all of these things that you want to do and want to accomplish. And um, I think, you know, if you can't read the chat, you're getting all kinds of love from all over the world. Um, there's one from Hugs from Brazil and oh. positive and powerful human beings. And um, shout out to those that are waiting on their test results. Um, know that you do have a community of people and day or night, you can post on any forum, reach out to any of us and we're all gonna be there because this positive club, it shows empathy, which is something that your friends, your family who give you sympathy just can't touch no absolutely and again like I just want to say harping on what Jacqueline just said about reaching out please 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 reach out like we're not here to say yes get tested or no get tested this is so personal 
but we're here to be sounding boards. All right, so thank you guys so much. Again, thank I love you guys. Home. Nice to meet you, Ramona. And wow, thanks everybody. Thank you yeah. everybody watching. Um, so we did go over, but there is a little bit of time left to do yoga with Natalie, if you're interested. Um, and then after break, there's gonna be a Q and A session talking about how to talk to your children about HD and, ma and managing behavioral symptoms. So go get some stretches in some steps in and we'll see you there bye guys thank you see you later yeah